I'm Ian Odgers, uh, and I have been in this business for 44 years, I think, that sort of time, uh, and for 26 of the first 28 years of, of Odgers, um, I was running the company. Uh, so when I got first involved in it, it was literally uh, one small office with one small desk with one small filing cabinet and me. Uh, and a PA. And then in 1998, I then sold the business to Richard Boggs Roth, who is our current chairman, current chairman of the group. Uh, and I remained working within the business on a part time basis, well, ever since then. Well, I'm Jennifer Ward, and I'm a partner from Calgary in our Canada office. And I joined Audgers, uh, Audgers Berenson, in 2014. Uh, once the, the Canadian office uh, went through a transition to restructure the way it, it runs its business across the country, I was brought in as one of the, the first partners in one of the newly restructured locations in, in Canada. I've been in the recruitment and search business for over 20 years. Uh, it, it was my, my first uh, role right out of university, actually. And, uh, but I've moved into pure executive search over the last seven years. And so with Audgers in, in Calgary, I focus on both uh, public sector placement and uh, industrial services, typically supporting the oil and gas industry. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of the Audgers team. I think the, the business model that's been developed in Canada, and I think globally, uh, focusing on industry specialists and geographic focus uh, makes a, a lot of sense in our industry and I look forward to talking with you about that as we go through this interview today. <clears throat> I'm Kurt Proskart from Copenhagen. Um, I'm probably one of the few ones left <clears throat> picked by Per Bamson earlier days. Uh, he called me one sunny day. I was at that time uh, MD for a mechanical engineering company um, and uh, we should talk about the job, and at that time he had two clients in, in Denmark. One was Novo, and the other one was Mask. And oh, you probably pretty good clients, yeah, I reckon. Pretty good clients. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it ended up uh, by uh, a talk about how could I start and establish uh, uh, Benson International, as was the name uh, at that time, um, uh, up in the, the cold north. Uh, which I, I did then. Uh, I jumped from an executive position into search, uh, got uh, an empty office in, uh, totally empty, no electronics, no nothing. There was a, a Telefax machine and an IBM typewriter. <laughs> that was about it. Uh, so we started really from nothing. Uh, and nowadays we have uh, Two brands, uh, Audius Bernson as one, uh, and then uh, what we call Pointer, which is our second brand, who take the middle management part. So uh, we have uh, a solid base in, in Denmark and can measure ourselves against the big ones. Yeah. So, Kurt, I, I mean, when you look back over uh, from the late 70s when you started in this business, um, how have you seen search change within, certainly within the, the Danish and the European market? Yeah, I, I have seen um, a, a change towards uh, more specialist functioned uh, or uh, focused uh, CEOs. At that time, uh, and many years after that, was it typically a background as an engineer and maybe an MBA like myself. Uh, that was a good background to, to uh, have uh, for becoming a good CEO. It has really changed a lot, I would say. But fundamentally, um, good results, proven track record, and a good personality that uh, has not changed. Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean, I agree with that. And first of all, the 
all search was very generalist. There weren't yes. specialist uh, sectors at all, um, and the, the firms were really quite small. Uh, yeah. So you know, you would typically find search firms of uh, really up until the 1980s uh, in the UK of not more than six or so that sort of number. And there was a view, certainly up into the early 90s, yeah. uh, that anything bigger than 12 consultants was going to become unmanageable, uh, yeah. and you couldn't yeah. really do that. So things were very generalist in those days. I mean, you compare that now with the hundreds uh, of consultants there are, in the, in the, as they are with us uh, in, in Odgers Berenson, uh, and or they are within the other large firms, but, which has allowed for the specialisms to come out. The, the, um, the other thing, of course, was that there was really no technology, as you were saying, absolutely, absolutely no technology. Yeah. So that uh, the little black book uh, was a very important part, uh, which is who did you know and who had you met and things like that. And there were no computers or anything like that. I mean, we developed, uh, when I started, I mean, we, because <laughs> my brother started the firm uh, and worked on a part-time basis on the firm. And when I came into the filing cabinet and I looked for, you know, some way of giving me an indication of, uh, of who was going to be appropriate for a particular job, uh, so I looked for you know, some sort of coding system, none. I looked for some sort of, and I finally would find a file, and I would find this really, really important <coughs> bit of a, a, a description that he would give me as to what this person was like. It was always a good chap. <laughs> yeah. That was it, nothing more. No commentary on his skills or his abilities. He was a good chap. And they were always he's, Very I'm afraid. There, there's no yes. she's in those times. It's interesting listening to both of your stories and how you entered the industry and what the industry was like when you entered it. You know, you spoke about the 70s and, and you know, maybe heading into the 80s. Well, I, I got into the industry in the 90s. And, uh, you know, it, it, I used to hear the stories of, of how candidates were interviewed and how they were coded and managed the way that you just described. I joined the industry at a very interesting time because in the early to mid-90s, um, you know, when I first joined the industry, a lot of things were still done manually. But within about two years, this incredible thing called the Internet started to become a useful tool for us. And, and it seemed like virtually overnight we went from doing things very manually to doing things with speed, quickly and, and if effectively and efficiently. And I remember there was a strong sentiment amongst a, you know, a certain client base that uh, didn't particularly love the necessary evil of paying recruitment fees. And they believed that they could use the, uh, the internet and technology to their advantage such that they would effectively put us out of business. So I remember in the early years, a lot of the strategies that we had to employ in the industry were really around how do we remain relevant when everything is changing. And, and that's, um, things change very, very quickly at that point in time. And, and, and those reliable and effective ways of, of managing our inventory and uh, coding candidates and uh, doing all of that historically you know, be, quickly became a thing of the past. And the other thing that started to happen was as we recorded information electronically, there became this big concern about privacy. Mm. Where, where is all this information going to be? Who, who, we didn't understand it. Who has access to this? Is this, this internet thing, it's just, it's just out there and we're, we're putting information in places and we have no control. And so that, that is also when in, um, you know, where, where I worked in particular, we started to have many, many discussions about what exactly can we say and what can we ask candidates and clients knowing that it, it's, it's out there somewhere and, and the wrong person could get their hands on this information. So it was, it's fascinating to reflect back on, on this um, really frightening new era that we were in, exciting but frightening, um, and then seeing how it's evolved from there. Is that because you have the social media impact, yeah. you have uh, the speed uh, things uh, are occurring, but you also have um, back to basics that uh, a good interviewer who doesn't speak all the time is still uh, number one. You can come with all the tests you want to, and clients tend to like them. Uh, I'm not a big uh, fan of tests because you can, it's, it's like uh, elastic in, in uh, meters. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you can you can uh, do whatever you want uh, and say whatever you want and you can suit things to 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 fit together but but i think the good interviewer the good interview should uh, be the, the the best proof uh, of the whole thing i think mm -hmm. I, I, let me sort of pop in for a moment and i think that uh I think some of the things that haven't changed at all, uh, and I will then maybe try and relate that to where we stand now. Uh, we developed uh, many, many years ago a certain concept uh, mm. behind our search, um, and this arose from a search that I did uh, many years ago uh, for a chief executive, divisional chief executive of a significant uh, firm in the UK, one of the biggest of its of its size of its nature uh, and um, I three years after that I happened to take the chairman out for uh, to the Wimbledon uh, to entertain him there um, and I said to him and how is this particular person getting on mm. and he said and this is my fault oh I'd forgotten that you'd put him in uh, what a foolish thing on my behalf he <laughs> said that was the best appointment we ever made and you were worth 10 times your fee. At that stage, I said, you know, what we're doing, what we're doing is really important if you do it well mm -hmm. and for which people are prepared to pay. Uh, and we're not just looking to find somebody that just fits a sort of uh, a jigsaw puzzle at this moment in time. I mean, fit, there's a, a character fit now. We're looking for somebody who will perform over a number of years. Um, and we then developed this concept of saying, what we really want, the outcome we would really like is that three years after an appointment, a client would say, well, that was the best appointment I've ever made. So from that, we developed some calories. And I'll come back to the idea of where we stand now. Um, so I said, well, OK, if that's the case, how are we most likely to achieve that? And the better we know our client, the better the chances are. Absolutely. The better we know our candidates, mm -hmm. the chances are. The better that we know where this company is going, the chances of that. So what we did was we then started off on the senior assignments of saying, let us try and talk to as many people around the position as possible. Uh, so if we're looking for a chief executives, we want to talk to the reports, we want to talk to the members of the board, um, and we want to see what is likely to happen to this company over the next five years. What are the decisions going to be made? That's very important. And then we say, now, what is the chemistry? Who is the person having to work with? Um, what are the relationships, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, so what are those things? And only at that stage will we say, OK, given all that, now what are we looking for? Uh, and then we can start our search. And we start out with our search, we say it's got to have this, this, and this. And it might be the same marketing director, for instance. But in company A, mm. it might be completely different from company B, which is completely different from company C. It depends, and all leadership, all leadership depends on context. And you know, some of my very best searches, I had maybe two people in the shortness, that's all. Uh, and the very first one uh, that we did, where we, the chap who, had, was 10 times his fee. <laughs> uh, the, candidate only, the client only saw one, just one. He saw him and said, that's it. And what happened, I have to say, 25 years later, that chap was head of the, the biggest operation within that, one of the largest companies in the world in his particular sector. Uh, it worked, it worked. But basically, the basic thing, and why we have been able to, let's say, take a step ahead of technology uh, up to now is that that first bit of the work, which is any search is context dependent. What is the context? That is the client to whom you're going. The relationships in which they have to work. All that sort of thing. And then the people, the candidates. But technology has helped us enormously towards it. And when you come into assessment and things like that, now I would never ever use assessment as my number one uh, tool for making an appointment, never but is often quite useful to pick out certain other areas where you might want to explore a bit further.
Well, yeah, no, and I agree. Lis listening to you, you know, some of the historical context, and, and I think you've said it too, Kurt, uh, you'll never be able to replace the, um, the value of, of having trusted relationships where, with your clients okay. when they know that you understand their culture. Yeah. And, uh, and, and regardless of how technology is leveraged to help you in your search work, uh, at the end of the day, they still trust that you think this is a good chap, as yes. you said earlier. So aside from the, the great relationships and the trust that they have in our judgment, knowing that we will most likely never put candidates in front of them who don't fit the corporate culture, whose um, you know, personality style and leadership style, uh, you know, they, we know that those have to align with what the, the client's culture is. There's also a real sense of, um, you know, I like to say a complete file on an ind individual mm -hmm. when they've gone through mm -hmm. the robust mm -hmm. uh, leadership assessment. Mm -hmm. As an interviewer talk all the time, uh, you do not get one single uh, characteristic of, uh, out of, of this candidate. I, I once had a candidate uh, in the early days and I was really so much in doubt whether he was fit for the job or not. So I called Per Bernsen and he said, did he impress you? So see, I said, not really, forget him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was his uh, clear card. He, he always looked for well-educated, young, uh, energetic uh, people who could run the show. And, and if they could have two degrees, it was an advantage. Could I have a slightly different view. A slightly different view. And I think we probably all do that. And it again comes back to the understanding of your client and the situation yeah. in which they are. Uh, and, uh, uh, and again, the same sort of reasoning that one might have in one case might be quite inappropriate for the next case. But I mean, uh, you know, what we were, um, well, for instance, what was our appointment in, in for the 2020, 2012 Olympics? Who's to run the 2012 Olympics? The last person you would have thought was the person from Goldman Sachs. I mean, it just doesn't make sense at all, does it? But it did. It made absolute sense. And it was, as you know, hugely successful. I, I remember uh, I should find the, the CEO of Copenhagen Airport, which was a grey, dull uh, building uh, outside Copenhagen. And now it's one of the, the best airports in the world. He, he said no the first time uh, I had him in for another position. He came from the insurance industry. I had him in for that and, and he rejected to talk uh, on that. And then I said, what about Copenhagen Airport? And he said, no, never. And he went out and the next day he called and said, let's take a talk. And he was so successful. Uh, he was uh, 16 years, I think. You know, with a client, I talk about the, the je ne sais quoi candidate, the one that, you know, there, there's just something about them. The proof is in the pudding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that, to me, that's one of the, the, the things that I like best about what we do is when right. you've got that sort of relationship with a right. client and they, uh, they'll interview anybody you ask them to because yeah, they, really, they really do trust your judgment. When I look at some of the people that we are currently putting into either VP or C level roles, particularly in mid-size organizations, mm -hmm. small to mid-size organizations, uh, they represent a bit of a different demographic. Um, and they are, these are, you know, we're, we're kind of looking for a lot of Gen X candidates right now to, to succeed the, the baby boomers. And those Gen X candidates, particularly the younger ones, um, I'm finding are demanding more from us than, than just our good judgment and mm. opinions on, mm. on people. And that, again, that's why I go back to when I was speaking earlier about the need for uh, reliable assessment tools. Because if you keep, you know, if you think about these individuals, these are, these are people who've grown up in the technology generation. So technology is a way of, of their lives every day, all day. Mm. And so they want to know that we're leveraging technology as much as we can to be better at what we do so that, you know, they are building sure. better companies. And we're talking about the, build, uh, the era of big data mm -hmm. uh, and you know, heavy data mining and all that sort of thing. 
And I think it's going to be very interesting over the next few years. I suspect that we're going to sort of move in that direction. And I think search firms have got to keep well ahead of that. And why we come back to saying search intelligence, at the end of the day, we're going to be successful because there is intelligence behind our search. It's right. not just data mining. It's not just that. It's much beyond that. In our business, it's one of the few businesses where experience counts, mm -hmm. I would say, long Otherwise, we would have stopped years back. Mm -hmm. uh, but but if you uh, you are good at what you're doing, you become better and better. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think that this is and it comes back to right at our very earliest discuss part of the discussion, the fact that we do have uh, these specialities in mm. depth, mm. but there is a lot of uh, working together across the specialities. Mm -hmm. We we think outside Denmark, like Holland uh, also do. Uh, because we, we are, uh, and are others as well, but we, we are not big enough to, to uh, have it all. Right. So we think uh, who could be the best in London, who could be the best in Frankfurt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that is fun. I love these assignments. But it forces yeah. you to really trust your colleagues across yeah. Europe. But I know who to trust. Yeah, yeah that's it. I, that's I know it. the people. That's and it. I know uh, if I say to, to uh, Klaus Hansen in, in Frankfurt, you should give me the best man, woman to this assignment, mm -hmm. then I get it. I mean, I think that all our senior searchers, almost all, are looking in a whole series of different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the, the chairs and CEOs of the FTSE, that's the top 100 companies, and I can't remember what it is, about a third or something like that, are not Brits. Uh, they come from mm -hmm. other parts of the world. Uh, but one of the, the uh, aspects of, of our business that I, I, I've seen change over the last few years and I think will, will change going forward is the emphasis on looking for diversity in, in our rosters of candidates, be it for, for boards or executive teams. Uh, almost every search that I launch these days uh, involves a discussion around the need for more diversity within the organizations mm. I'm working for. And, uh, and so we, we do pay special attention to that, it, of course, never at the expense of finding the best candidate for the job, but we, we really do work hard to bring diversity into our searches. Uh, and I, I'd like to just talk about our CEO for a day program and, and illustrate how I think things are going to look in 10 or 15 years based on that program. Uh, you know, that program, as you know, is, is um, quite, it, it's really gaining momentum in Canada and I think in some of our other European countries as well, and uh, where we align university students with CEOs mm -hmm. of various organizations. Mm -hmm. And the last step of the, the selection process for that program involves bringing 12 finalist candidates into our regional offices to spend a day with partners. And at the end of that day, we will identify the two or three or four who will be matched up with our CEOs. And I had a real epiphany when we went through the program uh, in 2015. When we brought those 12 finalist students to our office, I was immediately struck when they walked in that uh, not only were they 50% male and 50% female, and, and that was completely random. We didn't try to make mm -hmm. it happen that way. Uh, only three of those students were Caucasian. And it, it made me think that, and, and they were, uh, we were in awe of those students. They were, not only were they high academic uh, achievers, but they were comfortable and gregarious and personable and involved in uh, all sorts of altruistic activities and, you know, they played musical instruments and they were just, they were incredible young adults. And at the end of that day, my, the partners and I were reflecting on how impressed we were, and we got into a discussion about diversity going forward. And we concluded that if this is, these are our future leaders, diversity isn't really going to be a big issue in 15 or 20 years from now, because these are the people who are going to be sitting on boards and sitting on executive teams. And we joke that the, the diversity candidate at that point is going to be the middle-aged white male. So I completely agree with you. I think that that's the way it's going. And I think that diversity will become the norm uh, and we'll be looking for different sorts of diversity in the future. We need to consistently upgrade the quality of our consultants. Um, 
because we need to have the very highest quality of it. You know, when you think, well, as being the point that you were making, uh, you know, uh, what are the most important decisions that clients ever make, a company ever makes? The most important decision it ever makes is the appointment of its CEO. Sure. That's it. Yeah. And who are the people that are actually there helping them make that right choice? It's the executive search consultants.